I am no prophet, but I can accurately predict that there are several people here, right here today, who need your encouragement. They need someone like you to encourage them. That's just the way life is, right? That's easy to predict. Some of you have been beaten down this past week or month or year. Your service for the Lord has languished a bit. Your faith is drooping. You know, I think that, uh, unfortunately, I can also predict something else, and that is that last week and the week before and the week before that and the week before that, there are people who came here to church and did not receive the specific encouragement that they needed. And that is a failure to us, but is also a challenge to us that we can do better in our ministry of exhorting and encouraging each other. What an important ministry to keep the saints encouraged. I think many of you would like to know how to be better exhorters, how to actually do that, how to use your tongue in a way that would truly encourage someone else. Too often, I think the encouragement that Christians give to each other sounds a little bit like the world when the world tries to give encouragement to one another. You know, it... Uh, kind of appeals to self and lifts up and aggrandizes self with comments like, come on, you're better than that, you can do better. And that sort of builds up sinful pride rather than a real exhortation that would glorify Christ. Just give it a little more willpower, you know. You deserve to do better. The encouragement that the world tries to give each other to keep each other pepped up and going is not the encouragement of the Lord. It's very different. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 17, models for us how to encourage each other in a way that would really honor Jesus Christ and effectively strengthen the feeble knees of those who are around you, your brethren. Let's read this passage and learn from it today. Second Thessalonians 2, 13 to 17. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this he called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. Do you hear the encouragement there? Paul is encouraging this church. That's what he was doing. And it's an important task. Encouragement is an important task of the ministry of love in a congregation. It's one of those one another's we should be doing for one another. First Thessalonians 5.11, that's why it's called one another's. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. Do that. Build up each other. But how do you do that? How do you do that the right way? Well, Paul models here how to do it. And he does it so that we will know how to do it and so that we ourselves will be encouraged as we study this passage. I think there are three basic ways that Paul provides encouragement for believers right here. First, he thanks God for them in verses 13 and 14. Second, he directly exhorts them in verse 15. And then he prays for them, thirdly, in verses 16 and 17. What a simple model. He thanks God for them, he exhorts them, and then he prays for them in all three ways, you will see this is how you encourage believers and how you receive encouragement. I think you'll find a lot of encouragement this morning, and I think you'll be able to overflow with it and pass it on to others. Let's look at these three ways and learn from them. First, Paul thanks God for them. Look at verses 13 and 14 again. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. And then he goes on. 
This actually is the second Thanksgiving section of this little epistle. It's similar in wording to the one we already studied back in chapter 1, verse 3, where Paul opened the letter. And just as before, Paul not only gives thanks, but notice he says we ought to do this. He is obligated to give thanks to God for this church. Back in chapter 1, what did he thank God for? Well, he thanked God for the virtues that God had placed inside of them. He saw that and knew that was from God. He thanked God for them. Here he's thanking God for what God is doing, and he goes to eternity past and goes all the way through eternity future, what God is doing in them in that entire line. And by by thanking God for that, he gives them perspective as to where they are. The connection to the previous section on the Antichrist we just covered the last couple of weeks in chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, would be this. Unbelievers are going to have a powerful delusion that overtakes them in the end times from the Lord. They're going to face the wrath of God when Jesus returns because they did not love the truth when it was given to them and they turned to believe the lie. But the true church, the Thessalonian church, our church, the true church is saved according to God's eternal plan. That is an extreme contrast we're thanking God for. They get wrath, we get deliverance. What a contrast. And the thanks commences with a statement of God's special love for believers. Did you notice that in verse 13? That's very important. For you, brethren, beloved by the Lord. The Thessalonian church, Paul says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, was beloved by by the Lord. Lord there meaning the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus loved that church. It says so right there. So when Jesus returns, unbelievers in front of him will be slain along with the Antichrist, but believers will not be. Why? For they are beloved of the Lord. They are beloved of the Lord. That's wonderful. That means they're special in the Lord's eyes. What a rich designation this is. What a close relationship believers have with their returning Lord. It reveals the incredible privilege it is to be a believer, to be beloved by the Lord. Already you should have learned something that can encourage somebody. You can tell them as a believer, you are beloved of the Lord. He loves you. It's not really, ex exhorting others is not really about finding out what they're doing wrong and telling them you shouldn't do that and wagging the finger. There's a lot more to encouragement and exhortation than that. It starts with some truths to be reminded of and strengthened in. Note how very important it is to affirm believers in their faith. You are beloved of the Lord. That's important. They were in the midst of persecution. They might have thought, what? We're suffering. God's forgotten us. Why would he let us go through this if he really loved us? And so Paul writes, no, you're beloved of the Lord. Even the trials you go through are designed by God's love to improve you and to get you ready for eternity. They and we should be encouraged because God has placed his love upon us even as we go through hard times. You lose a job as a believer, God loves you. He's still looking after you. He hasn't forgot your family. You have a prayer that hasn't been answered. He exhorts you, keep praying, check your motives. God loves you. You feel lonely, neglected, picked on. God loves you. He cares for you. He looks after you. It's easy to think that God's forgotten you when things like that happen. But you need to hear the truth. You are beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is deeply committed to you. When he returns, you have nothing to be afraid of. Jesus will thrust, severe rejection and violence on unbelievers, but you have nothing to be afraid of. You know, there's some that go around preaching the gospel something like this. God loves you. God loves you. So accept Jesus. Of course, that's true. That comes from John 3, 16. God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But a gospel that preaches John 3, 16 and doesn't have John 3, 17 and following attached to it is an incomplete gospel and often a misleading gospel. You know, the apostles never went around the world proclaiming God loves you. You can read the book of Acts from beginning to end and you will not find that message. That was not their message. That's not evangelism. They warned much about the judgment of God, but they didn't go around with a message, God loves you. You know why? Because that's misleading. Because the world will hear that, I'm fine, God likes me the way I am, I don't have to change. He likes me, he's attracted to me. 
He's committed to me. He's already forgiven my sins. There's no consequences. I'll be received. I won't be rejected. And that sends a wrong message to people. Of course, God loves the world. He has pity and compassion on them. He knows they need salvation. But he never calls the world his beloved ones. Never. But he does for you. That's what he calls you. And Christian, that distinction is necessary for you to be properly encouraged when you hear God loves you. It's a different kind of a love. Next, we see what else Paul thanks God for about them. And as he's thanking God, he's giving them truth, their election. Look at the middle of verse 13. Because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation. God's election encourages. The doctrine of God choosing some to be saved is something that few churches teach these days anymore. And it's sad because it's right there in the Bible. It couldn't be plainer. Amazingly, Paul here is actually encouraging them with the doctrine of election. What is election? It's not the thing that happens the first Tuesday of November. We're not talking about that. It's probably in your mind. The verb here is past tense form of ireo. It means to take for oneself. In the middle voice, it means to choose, to pick for oneself, to take to oneself. Paul usually uses a different word for election or predestination or choosing. Praorizo, he uses in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. Ekelegomai, he uses in 1 Thessalonians 1, 4. Those words mean to determine or to choose or to pick or to select. Election is all about God making a choice, choosing some for himself. It's exactly what it means. When God chooses someone, it's just like you would choose someone. You choose someone to be your friend. That means you've chosen others not to be your friend. You've passed over them and you've made a specific choice. That's what God did. He chose you. He picked you. He selected you for himself. If everyone was chosen, the very word chosen would be meaningless and would provide no encouragement to those who were chosen. As Jesus said himself, many are called, but few are what? chosen. That's not hard to understand. It just hurts human pride and all of the objections that God is allowed to be God. Why is God not allowed to be God and make selections? He chose the nation of Israel. He didn't choose other nations. He chose Noah. He didn't choose others. He chose Abraham. He didn't choose others. He chose Jacob over Esau. The Bible's filled with God's selections. Who does the choosing? Well, we've already given the answer. God does, not us. It doesn't say we choose. It says God chooses. God has chosen. God's the subject of the verb. God. God chose you for himself. Salvation. Listen, salvation is always initiated by God. It's not a simultaneous decision where man chooses the same time that God chooses. It is always God choosing first. And when man chooses God and chooses to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, he is merely bringing his will and decisions in line with what God has already chosen. Who is it that God chose? Well, he didn't choose everyone. He only chose some. He chose you if you are a believer. 1 Thessalonians 1, 4 says the same thing. When did he choose you? Well, chooses in the aorist voice. That's the past tense in Greek. That means it's a past decision. God made the choice sometime in the past. More specifically, it's given the designation from the beginning. And that's the correct reading, from the beginning. Which beginning? Well, it's unqualified. When you see an unqualified from the beginning like that, that means the very beginning. It refers to election really before time. When did God choose you? Long before you were you. Long before you existed, he chose you. Ephesians 1.4 explains, God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, the laying down of the world, the creation of the world. Before that even happened, God had chosen you. So how is that possible? Because God's outside of time. He can do that. That verse does not say that God chose Christ, although that's true. That verse does not say that God chose a method of getting people saved, although that also is true. It says God chose us. The direct object is us. Simple grammar. And he chose us in Christ. He already had the plan for us to be saved in Christ. He made that choice before the world was even made. Second Timothy 1 9, God has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our own works, but according to his own purpose and grace, 
which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. That's amazing. It blows my mind. Before Tom was a Tom, Tom was selected by God. I don't understand that. But that encourages me greatly. Why did he choose us? He chose us for himself, as the verb means. Yes, he chose us so we would be saved. We'll get to that. But he did it for himself, to bring honor and glory for himself. He chose a people for himself. Remember, we're beloved to him. He loves us. Loved is in the perfect tense, showing that it's a past action with ongoing results. So election and the love of God placed on us are vitally joined. He beloved you because he chose you. What criteria did God use to choose us? Well, this is where it gets humbling. There's nothing in us. He didn't say, you look like a better crop of people. I'll choose you. You know, if I, if I was going to the grocery store, I want to choose the better products if I have the budget for it. That's not how God went and chose the worst. He went to reach out and chose the, the non-successful so he could show his power with them. His choice had nothing to do with our initiative. It had nothing to do with some virtue he saw in us that was greater than somebody else. He didn't look into the future and see who was going to be wise enough to believe in him and then choose that. That would be us choosing him anyways. That would neglect election. Romans 8.29 says it was according to a pre-relationship he had with us. He knew us. He had a, a relationship with us before the world was even made because he's God. And because he had that relationship, he predestined us. God is outside of time. And his relationship with us goes way back then, even though we didn't even exist. And that just pops the top off of my head. He made a sovereign choice. No one limited his will. No one twisted his arm and said, choose this one. No, 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 God, choose that one. Ephesians 1.11 says, we have been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. He consults what he wants to do and then does it. It's that simple. What were we chosen for? Salvation? It says so right here. Salvation is what? It's delivering us from destruction that's coming upon all evil. We're going to be delivered from it. Judgment is coming. Jesus and the cross and salvation and the Bible and the gospel and church and all this stuff doesn't make sense to anybody out there in the world until they understand they're going to be destroyed. God's going to destroy them forever and put them in an eternal punishment. Then deliverance and salvation starts to sound pretty sweet. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He destined us for this. People get all over Calvin for teaching what the Bible says. Here's a quote from Calvin. He states the reason, this is the quote, he states the reason why all are not involved and swallowed up in the same ruin because Satan has no power over any that God has chosen so as to prevent them from being saved, though heaven and earth were to be confounded. There it is. We are going to be saved because he's chosen us. That's how it works. How does election actually, though, work out in the present time? Notice at the end of verse 13, it works through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. Some prepositional phrases that qualify it. Sanctification, it's through that. The preposition there is and. It means through, by means of or even in the sphere of, location of. No election of God works apart from sanctification and faith in the truth. Election leads to divine calling. We're going to see that. And divine calling leads to God declaring us innocent. That's called justification. And then justification leads to sanctification. What is sanctification? The Greek term is hagiosmos. It means consecration or separation. We're separated from all that's common. We become special. God set us apart for what? For his special use. Sanctification, in one sense, happens immediately as soon as you believe. As soon as you became a Christian, God set you apart and said, you're mine. You're no longer one of the group in the world. You're different. You're now set apart. But sanctification also is described as an ongoing process where we become more and more detached from the world in the way we think and the way we behave. We become more and more holy. We become less and less like the world. You become less and less like the people you used to hang out with and party with. I'm thinking of my former life. That group of people that you used to fit in when you were unsaved, you're less and less like them. Why? Because you're going through a process of sanctification. He's changing you to be more and more like Jesus, and Jesus doesn't fit in with this world. And that's an ongoing process. 
We're being conformed to the character of Christ through sanctification. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 says it's God's will, your sanctification. And notice sanctification is of the Spirit. That means the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the active agent in our sanctification. We can't do it ourselves. We're supposed to cooperate with it, but we don't have the power to accomplish it. By the way, it's precious that we have all three members of the eternal Godhead mentioned at work here in our behalf. Thanks is given to God the Father with a clear reference to love by God the Son and here to the sanctification by God the Holy Spirit. The three in one, the eternal God is working for our benefit. Now, Paul also mentions election working through faith. Faith is the human response to the work of God in our hearts. God does not believe for us. We must believe. Believing is the responsibility of each person. That's why they're commanded to believe. Notice that it's faith that's faith in the truth. God never asks us to trust a lie or something that's unbelievable. In contrast to those who did not receive the love of the truth, we're believers. And that means we put our confidence in the truth. And though God brings about salvation, man must cooperate, and he does cooperate as God works in his life. Faith is not a human achievement. God doesn't award salvation to those who had faith because they're better than those that don't have faith. Faith is a humble thing. It's a humble response. It's a beggar's hand. I need salvation. Please, Lord, I trust in you. It's like the thief on the cross who's dying next to Jesus and says, Lord, remember me when you get to your kingdom. What could that thief give to Jesus? He's paying for his own sins. What was he going to offer Jesus? What work was he going to do for the kingdom? Nothing. All he could do is express his faith publicly. That was it. The capability for coming to faith is not innate in sinners. We're sinners. Faith involves an act of the will and the will is bent by sin, away from God. Faith is an act of the mind, and the mind is hostile toward God, Romans 8 says, and blind to the truth of God. We even sung about that this morning. Divine choice is seen, though, when someone believes. When someone believes, now you know whom God has chosen. God does not choose us when we choose Him. We choose Him because He chose us. But the choice, nevertheless, is a real choice by each believer. The act of believing comes from a human will that has been opened up and empowered to believe by the Holy Spirit. Dr. Hebert writes, Paul knew well that the faithful preaching of the gospel was God's means for realizing in them what he had planned in eternity. He planned not only that we were going to come to salvation, but the way Paul would be bringing the gospel to them so that they would believe. Amazing. An eternal plan working out in all of the details of human choice throughout all of time. Do you see how encouraging this is for believers to understand? It may baffle your mind, but that's who you are. That's what God has done for you. Paul thanks God for his work in believers. It's humbling, yet it's very, very encouraging. And there's more. Verse 14 talks about our calling. It was for this he called you through our gospel. In other words, calling works in harmony with God's selections. The same God who selected them is the God who made sure the gospel came to them and made sure they believed in that gospel, that call that drew them to himself. Paul's preaching was God's will. And God did the calling, not in some mystical way, but through the very preaching of the gospel by Paul. God elects some and then he calls those chosen ones to salvation through the preaching of the gospel. This calling is not the general call that goes out to the whole world where people are told in crusades and on the radio, come to Christ, believe in Christ. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is a specific summons to salvation on the part of the elect. As Romans 8.30 says, those whom God predestined, he also called. And those, these whom he called, he also justified. That means he saved. Everyone called this way gets saved and brought all the way to glory. Everyone called by God in this special summons comes to God. They never resist it. As soon as God reveals the glory of Christ and the beauty of his person and the benefits of salvation and the coming wrath, as soon as that becomes clear to their heart and their mind and their will, it becomes irresistible to the human soul. And they say, yes, no one ever says yes, because they hate it. They say yes, because they love it. The offer is too great to refuse. God makes salvation irresistible. No one says no thanks when they really see it. 
1 Corinthians 1, 9, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with His Son. He summoned you into that relationship that He had with you from eternity past. And last but not least, look at the end of verse 14. We see one more aspect of how Paul is thanking God. It's glorification. You were called that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, when I think about salvation, I just hope to get out of all of the judgment that's coming. I'm happy just to be the doorkeeper there in heaven so I don't have to be outside where the fire burns forever and ever. I don't care what I get on the inside. Just put me on the inside. But God's not satisfied with that. He wants to crown your head with glory. I don't think you believe that. I don't think I believe that. I think we'd be much more zealous for the work of God if we really believe God is going to crown us with glory. I don't know of anyone that suffered for the cause of Christ more than the Apostle Paul. Do you? Shipwrecked, beaten, imprisoned all over the place. Spoken against. And he says, the suffering of this present time isn't worthy to be compared to the glory that's to be revealed to us. It's just, you don't even put it in the same arena. Don't even think about it. The suffering is so puny. And my suffering seems so great when I go through it because I'm self-focused too much, you see? We're going to receive glory, gain the glory of the Lord Jesus. That doesn't mean we're going to become Jesus. That doesn't mean we're going to become divine as the Mormon church falsely teaches. There's always creatures and creator. The creator will always be the creator and the creatures will always be the creature. But he shares his wonderful divine glory on us. He pours it out on us. And we gain that. It's just amazing. This is that same glory when he comes back in all of his amazing glory that no Hollywood picture could ever replicate. And all that glory pours out all over his saints and the glory is reflected back to Christ and we get that. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, For God has not destined us for wrath, but for attaining salvation. There's, there's a great amount of salvation coming. Paul says, momentary light affliction. That's how he describes his trials. Momentary light affliction. Guy was beaten up. Guy was left for dead in Galatia. Momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. Far beyond all comparison. I don't have the right perspective enough. Do you? Little suffering for Christ, that's earning us glory. Blessed are you when men cast insults at you, say all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. Rejoice and be glad because your reward in heaven is great. It's unbelievable. We're saved now, by the way, but this glorification speaks of salvation in its fullest sense. We're saved, but he hasn't beamed us up to heaven yet. Beam me up, Scotty. No, you got to stay down on the planet a little longer before you go. First Thessalonians 2.12, that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. You got to walk for a while. You got to walk in a manner worthy of that kingdom. And then he'll call you up and out to that glory. Isn't that amazing? Do you see what Paul has done to encourage them already? He's thank God for all this work that God has done in their lives. Use that as a method when you come to someone, you see them, they're entrenched in their difficulties and their confusion, and you're called alongside them. Don't start lecturing them. Remind them who they are. Remind them what God has done for them. Do it lightly and gently. But remind them. It'll warm their hearts. It'll draw them out of their self-pity. They'll begin to see that they're privileged. They'll begin to see that part of the problem is they've lost their, their confidence in what God is doing. And just by thanking God for them and what God is doing in them, oh, that'll encourage them. Truth grips believers, so let it grip them and teach this to them. Do it any way you can. Do it over the phone. Do it in a conversation here. Tweet somebody. Don't do that now. You're supposed to be listening to the sermon now. But make sure you do it. All right, the second way that Paul provides encouragement is he exhorts them. Look at verse 15. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. So then, ara, it points to your accomplished salvation. 
since it's finished, since it's accomplished, since it's a done deal for you, since you're going to gain the glory of Christ now, let me tell you what the practical implications are for you now. Now's where you get a little more direct with them and you begin to tell them, here's what you need to do. And they'll understand it better now. If you just go with, here's what you should be like before you remind them of what God has done in their life, it's going to be harder for them to listen to you. They may even not like you too much. You got to remind them who they are, what God has done for them, then tell them, here's what you do. And he calls them brethren. Please see the pastoral concern, the family flavor to his exhortation. When you speak to other believers, you're speaking to a brother, you're speaking to a sister, treat them like that. Talk to them like that. And so here we have a challenge, an exhortation, really two exhortations in verse 15. First one is stand firm. Stand firm. That's a present imperative, which means stand and keep standing. Stako means to stand. It's the opposite of falling away or running away or being quickly shaken as this church was in chapter 2, verse 2, when they'd gotten a false letter about the day of the Lord already coming. So what do we see? Election that takes us all the way to glory is a stabilizing doctrine that particularly helps people going through trial like persecution. Election through faith unto glory is a reassuring doctrine. It stabilizes Christian knees. As the enemy attacks, you're not going to run because you remember, I'm chosen of God. I am sanctified by the Spirit and I am predestined to glory. Why would I run? We've already won. He has a grip on your life. And, he, and no one can snatch you out of His hand. So why would you run? With a giant worldwide apostasy still approaching us even in this day, and with the spirit of lawlessness, according to Scripture, already at work in the world, and with the man of lawlessness, who knows, maybe appearing soon, Christians need to stand firm. They cannot take it easy. We can't be willy-nilly and silly all over the place. You, know, you heard about the terrible storms that hit uh, Tennessee and Kentucky and Alabama and other places, and you hear about these tornadoes. You know, Imagine people looking and they see a storm coming. Is that a time to start a backyard game and start playing around? No, it's not. It's a time to run for cover. But in this case, in the illustration, it means we stand firm. We're prepared. We know what's coming, and we know we're going to win. There are many people that are going to try to knock you off of your path for Christ. It'll come up subtle to the side of you. Sometimes it'll come with intimidation in the front of you. Sometimes it'll come someone stabbing you in the back. But someone's going to try to throw you off somehow. You've got to stand firm. Someone's going to try to throw the church off. We have to stand firm. They're going to try. But we have to stand firm. I love Philippians 4.1. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown in this way, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. Or 1 Thessalonians 3.8. For now we really live. I like how Paul writes this. Now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. What a joy for a church planner to hear that church is still standing in the Lord. Or 1 Corinthians 16.13. Might be a theme verse for our men's ministry. Be on the alert. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. We need men like that in the church. Bible Knowledge Commentary makes this comment. Christians are in constant danger of being swept downstream by the currents of ungodly culture. They are also prone to let the truths they know and the relationship they enjoy with God grow cold. They need to vigorously hold to what they have been taught by God's servants. And that leads to the second exhortation, which is really connected to the first, and that is hold to the traditions. Hold is a word that means to grasp firmly with the hand. Tradition is the word paradosis. It literally means the things that were handed down from generation to generation. From the original apostles comes teaching and it gets handed down to churches who then hand it down to the next generation and to other churches that they teach as well. So the idea is don't let slip out of your hand all the godly teaching and the sound doctrine that have been given to you. Hold firmly to that and stand your ground and work for the Lord. Don't let it slip out of your hands. Don't let it be stolen craftily by the evil one. 
This language of holding to traditions is actually Jewish in origin. The Jews handed down the teachings of Moses according to Acts 6.14. But the traditions that Paul speaks of here are God's teachings, God's doctrines, Scripture teaching, New Testament teaching. They're not the traditions that men make up, what we call the traditions of men. We do not want to hang on to the traditions of men. My, how often we start a tradition in church and that becomes more important to us than the Scripture. That ought not to be that way. Colossians 2.8 warns, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men. Tradition is used in the pejorative sense by Jesus in Mark 7.3. There it's called the tradition of the elders. We don't want the tradition of the elders. We want the tradition of the eldest, God. And what, his, what he says, God's traditions are not like the traditions of men or the Jewish elders. Those can and often should be broken. The Pharisees severely criticized Jesus for not holding to the tradition of the elders. The Catholic Church today chides the Protestant Church for not holding to the traditions they say were handed down through them and through their church. But these are not from the apostles. In fact, many of them contradict the very teaching of the apostles we have in writing. So traditions does not mean extra-biblical church dogma. We're not charged to keep that. It's to line up with what the apostles teach. That's our New Testament. That's Matthew to Revelation. Jude 3 says that we have a faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. In other words, God took this this faith, this body of truth that we have in that one period of time when the apostles were on the earth, he handed it down to us. It's not continuing to trickle down through church history. Even our Lord's Supper that we celebrate here is a tradition that came directly from the apostles. Paul says, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. And he says, here is the tradition. It's an inspired from the scripture tradition. So we don't invent things We take them, hang on to them, stand our ground, and hand them off to the next generation. We're not called to be creative with truth. We're called to be faithful. Notice at the end of verse 15, they are the ones this church was taught either by mouth or by letter. By mouth is the inspired spoken tradition by the mouths of apostles who are also prophets and other traveling prophets who are able to speak new divine truth at that time. Or by letter, that refers to the inspired written record that we have accurately preserved through us for 20 centuries. Paul says it doesn't matter whether it came to you orally or in writing. If it's inspired from the Holy Spirit, receive it and hang on to it. That was certainly true as the New Testament canon was being formed and not every church had all of the letters and the Gospels. There were still prophets in the church speaking new truth, and the church didn't have all of New Testament doctrine. So they were to receive both the letters and what was spoken. That was going on at that time. Today, the church has only the written record left. Someone comes along 2,000 years later and says, I have preserved accurately the sayings of Jesus through oral transmission. Nobody should believe that. That's impossible to believe. Only the written tradition can be verified as from the Lord through the apostles. That's the number one criteria for why a book was in the New Testament. It was either written by an apostle or with the supervision of one of the apostles. They were the ones promised that God would speak powerfully through them in an inspired way. Again, I want you to see how encouraging this is and how we can use this to encourage others. Ground people in the faith, tell them to stick with it, urge them to love Christ, come alongside of them, be their friend. Tell them, let's be faithful to do this together. Exhortation is an important part of encouragement. After you thank God for what God is doing in them, exhort them to stay true to Christ. And sometimes these exhortations are going to have to be pretty pointed. You may have to tell them, look, you've been neglecting your brothers and sisters in Christ. You've been neglecting your quiet time. You have wrong priorities. Do you see that now? I'm urging you. It's good for you. Make sure you get back in the church. Make sure you pick up your Bible. Don't be tripped up. Or please, let go of that fear. God has promised that He's going to be with you. Why are you hanging on to that fear? Why are you doing that? How is that helping you? Let go of it. Experience the joy and peace of God. He said He'll never leave you or forsake you. 
Or quit looking at that pornography that's destroying and poisoning your soul. Quit doing that. It, 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 it's putting out the fire of the Spirit of God in you. And you know it. Stop it. And you need to exhort them and tell them what to do and tell them what not to do. That's encouraging. That's helpful, even if it's a bit painful. The third way that Paul provides encouragement is he now prays for them in verses 16 and 17. Look at that. It's just a beautiful prayer. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. Oh, this is just oozing with encouragement. Wouldn't you want someone, I can almost see the Apostle Paul raising his hands to pray for this church and just praying for them. This, this godly man who suffered so much for Christ, thinking of them and praying for them. Do you know how warm that is to have someone who loves you stand over you, stand next to you, sit with you and pray for you? They care about you. They're aware of what you're going through. They're interceding for you. They love you. Do that for others. That's what he's doing here. And he's teaching again, isn't he? He's pouring forth the teaching even as he prays. This is a prayer. This is a benediction. This is not just a mere wish. This is in the form of a prayer. He's bathing them with prayer. Paul understood nothing happens in the church without prayer. He learned that. I'm not sure we've learned that. We need to bathe our ministry in prayer. After you've given thanks for how God is working in the believer's life and reminded them of truth and you've strengthened them with the exhortations they need, finish it off. Finish it off with a warm prayer for them. Stop and pray that God will do the very thing that you just told them they need to do. Stand firm. May God strengthen you. See how he did that? You stand firm. And he turns to God. They can't stand firm without you. <laughs> May God comfort and strengthen your hearts. The only God can do that. He even says, May the Lord Jesus Christ himself, there's an intensity there. And then he talks about God and his love and what the qualifications are of the Father. He prays to the first two members of the Trinity, please notice, the Father and the Son, not the third. The Holy Spirit is the one who takes the will of the Father and Son and activates it in your life. That's His role. You don't pray to the Spirit. You pray in the power of the Spirit to the Father and the Son. And so Paul accentuates the work of the Son and then he shows the great qualifications of the Father. By the way, isn't it interesting the Son's name comes first there to show the Son, because usually it's the Father's name who comes first, but here it's the Son. It shows that the Son is to be equally honored with the Father. And yet the two always are one, right? I and the Father are one, John 10.30. Who is the Father? Why should we pray to Him? Why is Paul taking it to Him? The Father has loved us, it says. That's past tense, showing an act of giving His Son on the cross for us. We have the Good Friday service coming, and great reminder, but every Sunday is a great reminder of the death of Jesus Christ. The Father loved us. He gave His Son. And notice Paul even sticks himself in there. He loved us. So I'm loved too. I know it. And He's given us eternal comfort. Eternal comfort. I don't even know how to preach this. I, I can't squeeze that statement enough to make you feel what he probably was feeling when he wrote that. He has given us eternal comfort. Paraclesis is the word comfort, a coming alongside to help someone else. God never leaves our side. He's given us eternal comfort. The comfort and care that God has for us will never fail. Our comfort is everlasting. Our present affliction is only temporary. Trials are on a little timer, and when it dings, it's over. Comfort will never, ever run out. It has no expiration date. The balm of divine comfort will always be with us. And he says we also have good hope. The adjective good just means good of quality, good and beneficial. It's useful. Our hope is good. It's it's as we look to the future, as we have confidence in what God is doing, this is good for us. It sustains us throughout our life on earth. We are doing as 1 Thessalonians 1.10 says, waiting for God's Son from heaven. What are we doing? We're waiting for Jesus to come back. And He rescues us from the wrath to come, it says there. And all of it, notice the comfort and the hope 
The good hope is granted by His grace. We deserve absolutely none of it. And then we come to, we come to the actual request in verse 17 itself. May the Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God who loves us and has comforted us, may He comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. Comfort and strengthen your hearts. See, that's where we need encouragement. The heart is the center and the core of you. It's where you deliberate. If you're going to quit, it's where you lose the battle. Inside of you, you say, I I'm not going to do this anymore. That's your heart thinking. Or when you find resolve to press on and obey the Lord, that's in your innermost being. That's your heart. And so your heart has to be strengthened in the faith. It has to receive comfort and understanding. So you press forward. You know in your heart you're loved of God and you keep going. You know, in workout classes and going to the gym, a lot of people love to make their extremities strong first. They work on their biceps, on their arms, or they work on their legs. But a lot of the instructors will tell you, you've got to get your core strong first. You've got to work on the core. That's true in the Christian life. Your core has to be strong. Down deep inside of you, you have to be strong. And so that's what he's praying for. May God who loves you in Christ strengthen you in your innermost being. Because when you're strengthened, then you'll be able to do what it says at the end of the verse, right? Every work and word. Everyone. That's what he wants the church to do. Keep pressing on with your teaching. Keep pressing on with your exhortation. Keep pressing on with your evangelism and your witnessing all of the words that need to come out of your mouth. Don't be silenced because your heart has grown cold and your heart has become feeble. Keep speaking and then there's work to be done. There's hands of service and feet that need to be active for Christ. And I want to see this church always serving and doing and, and going forward with the work of God. Don't let it slow you down in any way. And I know for that to happen, you have to be encouraged and I know for you to be encouraged, your heart has to be strengthened and comforted, you see. That's what he's saying. The world can't offer this. What can the world do to encourage you to do this? All they will do, even when they, even when they think well to say something nice to you, they're only going to blow it and discourage you in your Christian walk. You can only get this from another brother or sister in Christ. That's it. That's it. Sometimes... Folks at church are like workers languishing under the, the heat of the sun in summertime. And you need to be like someone brings them some cool water, sits next to them, refreshes them, reminds them of truth, provides a little shade for them, encourages them to get up. The work is good. What you're doing is worth it. You know, no one may see in the church, no one may give you a little prize, but what you're doing is worth it. You have to believe that. You have to see your life in terms of eternity. You have to think back to eternity, past, eternity, future. You have to put all of this together and gain perspective. Your brother or sister in Christ sitting next to you needs your encouragement. Someone here needs you to encourage them. I hope and pray you are encouraged as you heard this and you learn a little bit better about how to exhort and strengthen those that are here at Hope because we're going to need a lot of encouragement through the years, don't you think? Amen. Amen. Let's celebrate the encouraging Lord's Supper now.